What's going on? I'm Trevor Stricker uh, from Disco Pixel. We're an indie game studio in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm here to talk about dynamic audio, the runtime remix, generating a soundtrack at runtime. So I assume if you came to a talk called Runtime Remix, it's because we're all on the same page that a dynamic soundtrack is awesome. I mean, your player can just kind of be idling about, and your soundtrack can go doot, doot. Then he can do something clever, and it can go doot, doot, doot. And then he can bring the noise, and it can go doot. As a little bit of background, I'm making a rhythm game uh, called Jungle Rumble, uh, where you use rhythm to control a tribe of monkeys. And there aren't, uh, there aren't any atom bombs or assault rifles, but I want the soundtrack to change all the time. Uh, I want it to sound like basically interactive tribal house music as the player moves along. And this is a rhythm game, so it has to sound awesome. I mean, if I'm asking my players to put on headphones, there better be some delicious sounds coming out of those cans. And it better have plenty of variation. It's gotta have crazy drums as they explore the jungle. It's gotta have water drips and drops as they climb up a tropical waterfall. It's gotta have rhythmic flutes as they reach a misty summit. My player is gonna hate it if the same old loop bangs incessantly at their skull. So there are a few ways to do that. One way is just to have multiple background tracks. Um, now, if you want to have tons of music, that's obviously tons of data. And if you're making a PC game where you can put everything on a DVD, that might be acceptable. I'm making a mobile game. Apple lets me send 50 megabytes over the air. And that's it. When you're making a mobile game, you think in megabytes, not in gigabytes. If you compress it and you want to have tons of audio, basically, you know, the quality trade-off is it's, it's going to sound like farting through a megaphone. Uh, if we want beautiful, delicious audio with a high sample rate and a lovely tone, what we really want to do is store the music sounds themselves and then play it back kind of like a MIDI or a step composer or a drum machine. Tons of samples are obviously much less audio data than a single track. So we can have our instrument samples and we can play them back. Uh, we can have you know, a piece of data that describes when the samples trigger and then we could look at the time into the track and what the frame rate is and determine what sounds we want to play that frame, right? Uh, I thought that sounded fine. I thought that sounded just great. And so basically, as part of my update loop, I was saying, what sounds get played now? And if a sound had to get played that frame, I would play one shot, and it sounded great to my ear. And then we were, uh, a bunch of indies from Boston went to, went to this cabin in the woods of upstate New York, and I was showing it to kind of a well-known indie developer named Aaron Isaacson who is not only a musician, he is a drummer. And I was so excited to show him my well-polished demo, because I'm like, if anybody likes it, it's gonna be him. And he played it, and he couldn't even get through the tutorial. He thought it was a stinky piece of poo, because the sound kept glitching. And I'm thinking, glitching, inconceivable. The timing is perfect. Maybe, a, I don't know, something spun up in the background. Maybe the garbage collector started going crazy. So we fired up my beat editor because there's less stuff going on. There's no AI. There's no spline drawing. And we just made a little metronome. And sure enough, it was glitching. And this is what it sounded like. So if you listen, you can kind of hear it stuttering. Turns out that doesn't work. 
Uh, you know, what are our minds? You know, sure, we, uh, we're learning machines, and, but first and foremost, it's a signal processing machine. And it turns out, when you're listening to something rhythmic or when you're matching audio to something you see, your brain can pick up timing gaps as small as three milliseconds. And my first attempt to play audio by triggering it in the frame had two important sources of randomness. The first is if you're playing it from an update loop, it depends on what order that particular component was updated. So in Unity, it depends basically on the contents of the scene. Now, if we're running our game at 60 frames per second, that's basically 17 milliseconds per frame. So that threshold of three millisecond timing, I, you know, there's plenty of room to mess up in there. The other thing is when you trigger a sample, there's actually a random amount of latency until the audio driver picks that up and actually gets it out to the hardware. You know, the specifics depend on the system. Typically there's, you know, some driver loop that's actually pulling for updates somewhere, but it doesn't matter. That latency can be anywhere from five to 50 milliseconds to even more, depending on the system. So obviously, if I wanna make a rhythm game with a locked in groove, this is not gonna work. So what I have to do is build the actual raw audio data at runtime on the fly. Now fortunately, Unity gives us access to the PCM data, which is what we need to do to build this. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows what PCM data is, uh, just in case. It stands for pulse code modulation. I think some engineer at Bell Labs in the 50s envision that. Uh, so audio is basically a sound wave, and the PCM data is the magnitude of that sound wave encoded as an integer at different points along that wave. Um, and your data is basically a sequence of these magnitudes. Now, uh, oftentimes you'll hear things like sample rate thrown around, CD is 44 kilohertz, super audio file quality is 96 kilohertz. That's basically how far apart those sample points are. You'll also hear sound referred to as 16-bit or 8-bit, and that's the size of the integer that encodes those magnitudes. Uh, so, you know, envision one-bit sound would basically be it's up or it's down. You don't have a lot of dynamic range. CD quality is 16-bit sound, which is, uh, what is that, 65K different values, which is actually considered overkill. Uh, also note, that's not bit rate, which is something for data compression, which is not what we're talking about. So to make a locked in groove at runtime, we need to create the actual uncompressed audio that we're gonna be playing back to the player. Um, so next up, I'm gonna be showing some actual code of how to do this in Unity. Uh, I tried to simplify it as much as possible. Code doesn't read very well on the slide. I've actually got some handouts. Uh, this dapper gentleman in the front can pass around. There's not very many of them. And I've also got this online in a sample project and I'll give you the URL at the end. So uh, how do we actually do this in Unity? So first at the top, we actually create the buffer for the, the PCM data that we're gonna put in there. Um, I had said that PCM data is integer, and it is, Unity exposes it to us as a float. So basically, we make a big array of floating point numbers. And that's what we're gonna play. Um, the next thing, we need the audio data we're actually gonna composite into that track. We get that from the audio clip itself. So sample up there is an audio clip that I just happened to get a point or two elsewhere in the code, and it's got a method get data, which actually copies it into that temporary data buffer sample data. And to actually composite the sound into, our, into the music that we're making, what you do is you go through, and for every individual value in that sample, you add the magnitude to the track that you're making. <laughs> 
So you can see that this actually takes a, a time as an argument. So this is a very basic way to play our sample at any point in the track that we want. So that's the building block. And uh, you know, you can swap the sample, you can change the time. And that's the basic thing. So how do we actually play it in Unity? So we have this, this PCM buffer, and we actually have to put that into an audio clip. Uh, and we can do that in code. So to play an audio clip, we need an audio source. Uh, I put that on the main camera just to make the code on the slide look as simple as possible. And we can use this method to play a locked in groove. And this is what that simple thing sounds like using that method. So it actually doesn't glitch anymore. It's a little bit of a metronome. But what you can actually do is you can change up the samples and you can get really crazy. Awesome. So that's the basic way we build our track at runtime. If only it were that simple. There are some wrinkles. So uh, the first is all our samples have to be at a consistent sample rate. I've been using them at 44 kilohertz. Uh, resampling at runtime is actually very difficult. Uh, you know, you can save some memory by making them 22 kilohertz. You can't actually, it sounds like an integer multiple. It's not. First of all, CD quality is actually not 44 kilohertz, it's 44.1, just to make our lives difficult. Second of all, you can't just throw out every other sample because uh, it degrades the audio really badly. The other thing, whenever we're working with audio, we have to think about levels and perceived loudness. So first of all, when you're adding all these samples into your final track, audio hardware is not Nigel Tufnell's amplifier from Spinal Tap. It does not go to 11. If you end up with a magnitude that's greater than one, you get what's called saturation, and it just sounds like crap. Uh, so what you actually have to do, if, the best way that I found to avoid this is just to make sure that my samples are all the same relative level so that it doesn't saturate. Uh, it's inevitable that you might get some. What you could do at runtime is check to see if you're saturating while you're building that track, and then lower the level of the sample that you're that you're adding, lower the volume. Dynamic range. Dynamic range is also very important. Sometimes when you listen to music, the slow parts are quiet and then it gets frenetic and crazy and it, it gets louder. Sometimes when you listen to music, the quiet bits are just as loud as the active bits. Uh, so um, like Skrillex is like that. If you ever look at the the wave for a song, it, it looks like a bar of soap. Whichever one of those you want is really an artistic choice, but one thing you should consider is dynamic range compression. Sometimes you might hear uh, audio engineers talking about a compressor. They're not talking about making the data take up less space, they're talking about adjusting the, the dynamic volume of that track so that the quiet parts actually have roughly the same levels as the loud parts. Phase cancellation is another huge problem. That happens if you're adding, if you have a sample that's like this, and you add a sample that's like this, you get this. If you are adding things that are of the same pitch, not a similar pitch, but the same pitch, like the same note from different instruments, this can be a problem, and it's, it's something you can detect by going through the track that you've created and looking at the average loudness and you know, seeing if, if that's a sane value. Uh, you can often fix that by subtly shifting uh, one of the samples that you add or just avoiding it to begin with. Uh, 
the other big problem is in the example I've got here, the notes don't change pitch. If you wanted to play a melody, which is one thing we're adding to Jungle Rumble right now, you actually have to have different samples for every note that you want to add. Uh, that may or may not be a problem. You can change the pitch of your samples at runtime, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. So this works at runtime. We need to make it so that we don't drop frames as we build this track. Um, when I instrumented the, the sample code that I just showed you, where it copied basically four conga sounds into a, into a loop, compositing those four sounds took about a hundredth of a second, which is 10 milliseconds, which if our whole frame is 17 milliseconds, is way too long. So what I do in my game is I actually slice it up so that I don't do it all in one frame. I distribute the work across multiple frames. So I'll do, you know, the first tenth of the track, one frame, and then the next tenth of the track, the next frame. So with 10 smaller slices, you can just spread it across multiple frames. The other obvious thing that I did is I copied the PCM data out of the sample every time I added it to the track. Modern architectures, copying large chunks of memory is probably the worst thing that you can do. Uh, so obviously, the samples don't change. You can do that all at init time when you load your level and you know, use the pointer to that memory for the rest of your level. So that's it. Um, obviously, we all love dynamic soundtracks here. They make your game awesome. And the example up there is online. So I think we still have a little bit more time. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Sorry, do you want to actually step up to the microphone? It might be easier. So, so in uh, Unity 4. Point maybe 1.5, I'm not sure, they added a new feature um, to uh, the audio sources, I think it's called, where you can pre basically enqueue it for a fixed sample time with a particular sample. Yes, I, I think that's actually as far back as Unity 3 point something. Okay. And okay. you can do that, and that does have perfect time. The problem is if your sound, if your music is going to go on for yeah. an undetermined amount of time, yeah. You, you either have to queue an infinite number of samples yeah. at startup, which is obviously impossible, yeah. or you have to requeue a new bunch of samples, and it, it'll glitch when you requeue a new bunch of samples. Oh, that's interesting. OK, thanks. Anything else? Awesome. Well, I hope you found it useful. <laughs>